we preview the 2022 NFL scouting combine from a Ravens perspective with a very special guest next here on Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And we've returned here with another episode of Locked On Ravens. I am your host, Kevin Allstriker of Ravens Wire. We are here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team. Every day we're free and available on all platforms. And thank you for making Locked On Ravens your first listen of the day. We're back here on Taco Tuesday. And of course, that means it's our regular Taco Tuesday guest joining us here once again to talk Ravens football. And that is Spencer Schultz of Baltimore Beatdown. Spencer, this is an exciting day as the scouting combine kicks off and we now get to see some of these prospects do their thing and either up their draft stock a little bit or for some of them they might tank it a tiny bit which is unfortunate but how you doing here today doing quite well we are on the eve of the combine and i guess two days away for, from some real action and free agency right around the corner so had some some time to rest the the football brain just a little bit and just watch some prospects take it in and get ready to, to really, really, really grind the tape thoroughly and have context of the combine, have some context of reports that come in and some other things of that nature and try and kind of put the the sifter through and, and find the gold ultimately, the strainer uh, to, to get out all the dirt and keep the good stuff. So excited for this part of the year. It's a fun part of the year that doesn't require too much heavy lifting ultimately, but here we are. I'm, I'm pumped for it and pumped to be back on Locked on Ravens for another week talking football on Taco Tuesday. Yes, it's great, and it's good to have you here again, Spencer, and especially with all this combine talk as things kind of get kicked off here pretty soon and go for a pretty long time as we get to look at these players doing the drills and figuring out, you know, what some of these intangibles are, how they perform in some of these things. It'll be really nice to see, but before we get into that, we'll preview the combine in the second and third segments. I wanted to start off by talking with you about a kind of minor transaction the Ravens made at the end of last week, and that is the re-signing of Tony Jefferson. Now, this is not like the, oh, the Ravens don't have to address the secondary anymore because they signed Tony Jefferson type move. But I think it's a solid depth signing. I mean, Jefferson in the games he played in Baltimore, he played really, really well, was able to tackle well, played his role well. And I think back when he was with his first in or in his first in with the team, he wasn't utilized properly. It, it just didn't work out the way that either party wanted it to. Come to the second stint, Again, tackling well, playing well, performing well. Spencer, was this a move that you were happy with the Ravens making, or would you have maybe wanted them to look in a different direction for that backup-type safety role? Uh, I think it's perfect. Co-cap out, new co-cap in. Tony Jefferson knows what Anthony Levine did for this locker room, for the special teams unit, for John Harbaugh, for Eric DaCosta, for Steve Bashotti, for Ozzie Newsome, for you know everybody involved, the spirit that he brought and the kind of intangibles that he brought, the, the dedication that he brought, the work ethic, the veteran leadership. So all of those things, I think, uh, on a cheap signing are, are going to seamlessly incorporate what Anthony Levine brought to this team as, as almost kind of their spirit animal or their mascot in ways. And I think that Jefferson's going to continue to bring that. You can see kind of the, the fun that he brings on social media, in the locker room, and the way um, that he just encapsulates what it, what it means to be a Raven. And I think he appreciates more than anyone else, you know, the Ravens bringing him in on a bigger contract a few years ago and at his roughest time, bringing him back again when they're hurting, he's been hurt and finding, you know, a safe haven yet again for him to kind of just go play football, uh, just go practice, go be in a locker room, go get on the field and make plays wherever he's asked to be. So I, I think that he's talked thoroughly about how much film he's been watching. And I think we saw him play with more kind of consistent confidence downhill and striking and diagnosing and processing than then we saw maybe at some of his better parts of Baltimore um, just whenever he was on the field he was doing some great things on special teams too so uh, it's not a, a move that's gonna you know shake the earth one way or the other but it's a move that gives you leadership and a guy that knows you know what the Ravens of you know 2017 2018 Eric Weddle Judon Zedaria Smith Suggs kind of has that feel for all those guys in the history of the Ravens and uh, what it's like to to be a successful on a successful defense in the in this organization ultimately. So again, you know, not gonna, not gonna send vibrations through the stratosphere, but ultimately is going to be a, a nice contributor and a nice guy to have in your locker room. 
Right. And it's not like the Ravens need him to be the best player on their defense or play 90% of snaps or anything. This is a solid depth signing move that, yeah, you, you talked about it. It's not a one way or the other. Hey, the Ravens are winning the Super Bowl now versus, hey, they're not winning the Super Bowl type move. But Spencer, what's your ideal role for Tony Jefferson? Assuming, you know, let's say everybody stays healthy and Jefferson's able to play the role that you would envision him in. What is that? Is it more of like a special teams guy, someone who plays half the defensive snaps or what does that look like for you? Yeah, I think he's a dime backer. I think that he gets snaps defensively, you know, comes in on third down, some three safety sets, four safety, four DB, five DB, six DB, you know, however you want to break it down. Um, third down and is going to be underneath, uh, cover tight ends and running backs a little bit, hook to curl, zone drop, spot drop, and kind of diagnosing trips and uh, blitzing here and there, doing a couple things and, and just being an underneath kind of coverage defender. See him kind of bluff, maybe rotate back into the back end here and there, uh, but not too often, probably at this point in his career, and then be a special teams player that is asked to, you know, hold down the fort and bring intensity and keep everyone accountable. So I think I see him being a guy that plays, you know, two, three, four hundred snaps defensively if he's able to stay healthy and is ultimately going to end up, you know, being a, a very heavy special teams contributor as well. So wish the best for, I'll, I'll call him the new co cap. I'm excited to have him back. He's a fun guy, fun player. Uh, he's a media favorite in many ways. So uh, uh, that aspect of it is, is, you know, maybe not quite as important, but is going to be fun to be around and I'm excited to see what he can do. Yeah. And you kind of talked about it a little bit a couple minutes ago, but some of the things that you took away from his 2021 playing time with the Ravens, what were some of those things going into a bit more detail with that? Because, you know, this is a player that Obviously, you mentioned he was hurt. He signed with the 49ers, played a couple games there, ended up signing with Baltimore's practice squad. And if it weren't for the injuries, never really would have maybe not gotten the big opportunity that he did get to play later in the year. But what were some of the things that you took away, either positively or negatively, that can kind of work for or against Jefferson as he really settles into a new role in 2022? Yeah, I think just staying in the film room, uh, being a film junkie and playing with confidence making mistakes fast, but it felt like, you know, he wasn't really out of place or making mistakes anymore. feels like he's seen it all at this point in his career. So I think ultimately just staying in the film room, uh, staying, you know, ahead of his rehab and ahead of, you know, ahead of his body, treating his body well and staying out of the trainer's room. Uh, so to speak, you actually, to stay out of the trainer's room in a bad sense, you stay in the trainer's room in a good sense. So that's always a, a funny phrase to me, but um, ultimately just taking care of his body, taking care of his teammates, taking care of his chickens and his mentals to quote Marshawn Lynch. So, I think Jefferson uh, got, you know, a bad rap a little bit in Baltimore, was asked to do a lot of things, had some up moments, some down moments. And, um, you know, his, his first tenure was uh, abruptly ended with a horrific knee injury as he was kind of really starting to settle in and have a good season there early. Has that bad injury in Pittsburgh, I think week five or six um, in that overtime kind of thriller game there. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to call him the new co-cap, like I said. I'm excited for the new co-cap NCO to – get back on the field. He, it feels like he was always born to be a Raven and brings that intensity and loves to hit and get guys fired up and, and be accountable and be excited and flammable and combustible in the locker room uh, in a good sense, firing guys up. So I I'm excited to see what he can do. And I think he's just got to continue to, to stay in that film room, play with confidence and uh, use all of his experience on the field and in the film room to continue to be a factor. Yeah. And here's kind of a fun one for you comparing first and second stints, for Jefferson, two plays. I want to get your opinion. Which was better? The Vance McDonald strip should have technically been a touchdown, but wasn't a touchdown play on that primetime game against the Steelers, or going to his second stint, that stop against the Rams, where he just bullies through Aldell Beckham and tackles Sony Michelle on that well, a two point conversion, right? I don't know if I, it was a two point conversion, but I don't know if I've ever seen a more jaw dropping play, uh, especially in like the regular season maybe a couple coming to mind, but top five Raven Steelers, 2010s, you know, post Ray Lewis, probably the biggest Steelers moment uh, that I can remember with that fumble pick, whatever it was, and, and should have just given him a touchdown for how spectacular that play was. I think like Vance McDonald's cleat touched his cleat or something. Um, doesn't count in my book, give him the touchdown, unbelievable play kind of ends up winning the game there. And then Anthony Levine ended up having the game ceiling interception uh, in that game as well. So, that play really left me speechless and is one that I play back in my head. I know it uh, sits in the, the Ravens hallway of still shots of the biggest plays in the franchise's history, because that was one of the more spectacular plays in the history of the Ravens Steelers rivalry. And we'll 
be seared into my brain for a long time to come. Oh, it was it was incredible. One of those plays I remember, you know, it, it pops up every couple months on Twitter, and I may or may not be the reason it pops up on Twitter every couple of months. But, I mean, it's, it's a play that deserves to be recognized. And, I mean, to Jefferson's credit, the two-point conversion play against the Rams was a phenomenal piece of tackling. I mean, recognition, being able to do that. But the way that Jefferson – it was all in one motion that Vance McDonald play where, you know, he kind of brings him to the ground, the ball jars loose. And I mean, yeah, it was like Vance McDonald, like the bottom of the cleat touched the ankle or something. And it's like, okay, like, like, come on, can we just give him the touchdown? But that, that play for me is one of the best plays in that Ravens Steelers rivalry. I completely agree with you, Spencer. And I'm glad that Jefferson is back and it kind of all comes full circle there with Co-Cap making the interception in that game and the new Co-Cap that you mentioned in Tony Jefferson having that Vance McDonald strip. But we'll head into our first break here. We'll make it back. We'll dive into the scouting combine. We'll talk about the offense from the Ravens perspective. So stay tuned for that. And we'll be right back. Football might be over for the season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance, props, where the next fire coach is going to land. Bet online that is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. Bet online remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to the Olympic coverage and information. So head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. We're back with our second segment of Locked On Ravens here on Taco Tuesday. Kevin Allstriker, your host still here with Spencer Schultz of Baltimore Beatdown. And Spencer, the scouting combine is, is huge for the Ravens. And it seems like they're going to have their eye on a lot of different prospects, a lot of different drills. We talked last week about some of the stuff that the Ravens have looked for in the combine in terms of intangibles and certain drills and just what they prefer versus what they don't prefer. But Spencer, I want to kind of get into more of a broad preview with you. We'll start here with the offense and talk a bit about some players that have maybe been on your radar. You've been looking forward to watching at this combine in terms of whether this will be the, the be all end all for, all right, this is a guy that maybe you want in a Ravens uniform versus, Oh, he didn't perform very well. I'm going to be more out on this guy. So starting on offense, what are some of the positions and some of the players you're looking at as the combine kicks off? Yeah, definitely along the offensive line. Uh, the two that kind of stick out to me very early are Trevor Penning and Daniel Falele. I think Falele has a lot of uh, wow factor. Apparently at IMG Academy, which is like a football factory in South Florida, that is pretty much a football school. They're, they're growing into like a tennis program and a basketball program, but it is a, um, the word's escaping me, but it is a uh, program just for athletes, essentially down there and Philele, according to IMG's uh, athletic training director and research director had the highest ever um, size relative. It was kind of like relative athletic score that Kent, uh, Kentley Platt does um, that everybody loves, but had the highest ever explosive score relative to size. Apparently he was jumping over 30 inches and over like a nine foot broad jump at 380 pounds as a high schooler, which is Alien like, which is what I like. I like aliens, draft aliens and prosper. Um, so I'm curious to see what he does relative to his size, which is in the 100th percentile. He is the 99.9th percentile size wise. Um, so if he's able to, you know, run in the lowish fives or mid fives, jump, you know, high 20s, low 30s, jump over nine feet, something like that. The short shuttle is a very underrated drill, um, kind of as a threshold for. Guys usually that run, I think, under a 4-3-4 short shuttle as offensive linemen generally end up turning into pretty good players. Uh, it's a short list. I'm not sure that Philele will do that, but relative to his size turning into something like that. And then Penning, um, same thing. I think that short shuttle is going to be impo- important. A guy that was a really great um, gap man blocker, but lacked a lot of you know, kind of fluent move- fluid movement skill in space. want to see him able to show a little bit more agility, quickness, be nimble at the combine. I think he's going to be a good linear athlete. I know that he can squat over 600 pounds. I'm sure he'll put up, you know, some bench reps and uh, things of that nature, but want to see him, want to see him turn out and turn in a good combine. I think he can solidify himself kind of a guy that maybe, you know, with a bad combine drops to the end of the first round, second round, you know, who, who knows, but with a solid combine, I think you're, you're a little bit more confident there. Ultimately um, a couple other guys that I'm, I'm interested about Rashid Walker, who I think is a, uh, kind of a hush hush prospect at this point. Uh, I'm not sure how he will test 6'6, 325 coming out of Waldorf, Maryland. Uh, no Lance Zerline is a Deion Dawkins comp for him, 
but a guy that is a, a pretty exciting, aggressive, uh, quick vertical setter that I think can do some nice things. So I'd like to see him test well. I want to see some of these guys that weren't in Mobile, these juniors, their arm length, of course, and just some of their measurables overall. Tyler Smith, another intriguing one. Um, Jamari Salyer, I'm curious to get some kind of second measurement opinions on. I think he was under six foot three at in Mobile, but had like 34 and a half inch arms. There's a really rare build of kind of short and long, uh, which which is rare. So curious to see if those those measurements are consistent. I think the combine does a little more job kind of getting some unanimous consensus measurements ultimately. But someone who's been lauded as a very limited athlete. So I'm curious to see if he's a you know, on the, on the RS scale, RAS scale, is he, uh, you know, is he a 1.2 limited athlete or is he like a five limited athlete? Um, you know, someone who's kind of more towards average Andrew Stuber, another one I'm curious about who was impressive, uh, played tackle at Michigan ended up playing center at the senior bowl, but he's like six, six with long arms and plenty of size to boot. Um, someone that I think would be a good fit for the Ravens. So I want to see if, uh, his body type has improved a little bit. Uh, a lot of people giving him limitations and, uh, you know, he did have some struggles against Georgia and uh, was a little bit straight legged at times. So curious to see how, how he pans out there. Otherwise, you know, wide receiver wise, I know the Ravens might not be in the market necessarily, you know, high round could, could shock the world and go with maybe a Traylon Burks or something if he falls into their lap. But um, that's a guy I want to start with at, you know, six foot three, six foot four, uh, 220 plus I want to see those, those explosive tests. I want to see those jumps. I want to see that 10 yard split uh, would love to see, you know, the way that he moves overall and kind of just the way he looks in comparison to other guys build wise, uh, I think can, can stand out above a class that's really lacking anyone else that, you know, in, in, in DK Metcalf's class, there's that infamous picture of him and AJ Brown uh, flexing and combine workout, you know, pre-draft stuff. And there's just not really any other athletes that, that have that kind of build that Herculean type build in this class. It feels like, you know, George Pickens and some other guys ultimately, but no one's going to be 220 plus uh, when it's all said and done, kind of testing and running and breaking tackles and doing things like that. Um, Calvin Austin, one that I think is just going to be fun. I, I like the 40. It's like, you know, I, I like watching the 100 meter sprints in the Olympics. And while the 40 doesn't have as much uh, importance as, you know, it might have used to, a guy like Calvin Austin, I think ran like a 10 400. Uh, in high school, 10, 300, somewhere around there, hit, I think, 22 miles an hour in Mobile and is a flyer, apparently might run some four twos. So curious to see exactly, you know, how how high he can fly. Who didn't love to watch John Ross run that 4-2 back in the day, that 4 one whatever it was uh, a couple of years ago. It's just fun to watch, and it might not mean the most in terms of football, but it's a fun event overall. So I'm um, curious for that. Uh, Drake London, another one that comes to mind. I am quite curious to see how this basketball football tweener who, you know, isn't going to have a ton of speed in the long speed game um, does just in terms of showing, you know, fluidity, movement skills, did some nice things out of the slot. I just want to see him be clean, fluid, see what he can do. You know, someone who can fly slam a jam on the basketball court, probably going to turn in a very impressive vertical, but uh, has a, has a very, you know, Lanky build, 6'4", 6'5", somewhere around 205, 210, 215. You know, what's it going to be? Uh, there haven't really been a ton of super successful receivers in that really tall but not very thick range. Um, you know, very wiry, kind of like an A.J. Green, one of the few that we've seen with a somewhat similar build. So I think a good day for Drake London can really shoot him up draft boards, even may maybe making him a top five player, top ten player um, in this draft class. So he's one I'm certainly curious about. Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson want to see what they can do. Overall, I know that uh, Wilson's not supposed to run a very fast 40, but I think he might surprise people, and I think his jumps might be pretty impressive as well. So uh, explosiveness is the name of the game. And the final wide receiver I'm really excited about is Christian Watson out of North Dakota State, another guy that's taller, a little lankier. Um, actually had like 50 carries last year, I believe, a lot of jet sweeps, but uh, well-built, was an all-American returner in the FCS, and can fly. So I, I want to see, you know, is, is that kind of a track speed type deal or is it more of a football speed type deal? You know, how pure is that speed? Uh, and it just gives you some good context for some of these FCS guys, some of these, you know, mid-major and FCS guys to to kind of compare them and contrast them. And I think it just gives you more context overall when you're watching tape. So uh, out of that wide receiver group, I'm excited to see all of those guys. Uh, running backs wise, Damian Pierce is a guy I think that has a lot to lose in uh, in the 40 there. You know, there are running backs that run 4-6 that are a OK. -okay. But uh, there's not a lot that run, you know, four seven four eight. So I want to see what he can do. A uh, guy who forced a ton of missed tackles, 
kind of has a little bit of a stronger Clyde Edwards Alaire feel uh, from what he did at LSU a little bit, a little more stout than that, to be honest. Uh, another guy I'm excited to see is Snoop Connor from Mississippi, who I think is flying under the radar. Uh, I think that he's got a little bit of wiggle. Um, had a, a really nice, uh, really nice video by Daniel Jeremiah, kind of comparing him to uh, Alexander Madison, the Minnesota Vikings running back, and definitely has a really impressive frame. So uh, I'm curious to see how he ends up testing uh, in terms of the jumps and some of those agility drills and things of that nature. Um, James Cook, can he can he run like his brother? Jerome Ford, another flyer. Uh, Rashad White can definitely run. So I think there's some some interesting running backs, a lot of different flavors. Um, Tyler Goodson is one that. I'm super curious about is a super late round running back out of Iowa that had some production, but seemed a little limited. His frame's not super um, impressive overall, but just made plays in college. Is he more of a, you know, a college playmaker? Is he a guy that has the athletic ability to, to stand out with a couple months of training here? Um, last one's Kyron Williams, one of the best blockers, like third down pass pro blockers. I can remember he's super fiery, uh, very competitive, picks up blitzes like a la Ezekiel Elliott at times. Um, you see, you know, the, the way the Patriots use running backs and you think he comes to mind. So if he can have a, an impressive day, I think that'll shoot him up draft boards quite a bit. If he can overall turn in a, a good day. And then again, just James cook, like I mentioned, Dalvin cook's brother, um, not a guy that has a ton of power in his frame. Want to see what he weighs in at uh, some saying he might be under 190, which is a little bit of a no, no, but if he's been able to add a little bit of functional strength and size to his frame, uh, he has, does has pretty low tread on the tires. So, He's exciting, but uh, a lot of running backs in this class. And then tight ends, ultimately, you know, who's going to stand up as the athlete? Is it Isaiah Likely? It feels like it probably will be. Um, out of kind of these more traditional tight ends, Jeremy Ruckert, uh, Kate Otten, and Jake Ferguson. Can any of those guys turn in, you know, a 4-6-7, 4-7, you know, jump pretty well? Who's, who's going to be the spectacular athlete there um, out of the bigger kind of traditional guys? Greg Dolchich out of uh, UCLA as well is uh, another one that, has a lot to, to show as a pass catcher. It's supposed to be 6'4". We'll see what he ends up being ultimately. Um, added 40 pounds while at UCLA, came in as a wide receiver. So I want to see you know what his frame actually is, what his measurements are, and kind of evaluate his room to grow through that lens ultimately. So that kind of takes us through. And uh, another fun one out of the local Maryland boy, Chiga uh, I think he's kind of like an H-back, 6'2"-ish, 240, probably going to play a, a weird role, but supposedly is a really high end athlete. So just want to see what he can do. I, I just love, love seeing who can kind of surprisingly take over and, and solidify their athletic prowess at the combine. Some of these late round guys or guys that are supposed to be UDFAs can kind of sneak up into the sixth round, seventh round, uh, late day three, just by testing really well. You want to bet on athletes ultimately, uh, you know, as opposed to, to betting on guys that aren't there's, there's certainly all pros who don't have a good RAS. And there's certainly guys that, you know, are in the high nines and tens that, don't have a, a very successful NFL career or aren't able to find the field. But to me, I'd, I'd rather bet on athletes than not. So that kind of sums up the offensive guys for me. Yeah. You know, we've seen this Ravens team bet on those athletes themselves. And it seems like it's something that they have looked for. And there are, I mean, the combine, it does have a ton of pull in terms of some of these guys. And you mentioned it, if these undrafted guys can get up into day three, if the day three guys can move into day two of some, Maybe early day two guys can push up into the late day one, mid day one type thing. So it, it is huge. And for the Ravens, they have plenty of offensive needs that they should solidify during this draft. I mean, I know it shocked many people when they didn't take an offensive tackle in the 2021 draft. And now they seemingly might take one two times or three times, you know, we don't really know, but there are a ton of guys, especially on that offensive line. I think many people are excited to see some of these prospects and, who could fill in, you know, in terms of a uh, long-term right tackle or someone who could switch over to the left side if Ronnie Stanley still isn't healthy? Some of that positional versatility, I think some of these scores, some of these drills will be able to tell a little bit about some of those things. Not, not everything, but, but just a little bit. But we'll head into our final break here. When we get back, we'll flip the field, talk about some defense for this Ravens team at the Combine. So stay tuned for that. And we'll be back soon.
This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure from pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer? It's usually the only brand the warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. You can save time and money when using Rock Auto. Rock Auto is a family business. So you can do your yourselfers for over 20 years, and they are reliably low for every customer those prices are. So go to rockauto.com right now and see the parts available for your car or truck. Just right, locked on. And that had you hear about us back to so they know we sent you amazing selection of live below prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. We're back here on Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostrich, your host, still here with Spencer Schultz of Baltimore Beatdown. Talking Combine is it set to kick off? And Spencer, talking about that offense, there are a lot of guys, but on the defensive side of the ball, there are other needs that this Ravens team has to look at. Obviously, some of those front seven positions are key for them. In the secondary, they have some question marks as well. So moving over to the defense, kind of the same thing I asked you before, but are there any guys, any positions you're looking at for some of these defenders where this could either push them into, this is a guy you want on the Ravens versus this is pushing them out of that conversation for you? Yeah, I think that testing of any position group is most important for edge defenders and pass rushers overall. Um, there's been kind of a, a well, well-known metric threshold of guys that can jump uh, towards the the higher realm of nine feet, around nine foot ten, nine foot eleven. Uh, so essentially, ten feet can jump thirty four inches vertically, can run under a four seven, um, have over a thirty three and a half inch wingspan, and have under a six nine three cone. That kind of is really the the cutoff for successful versus unsuccessful sack generators um, at the combine. So there's there's certainly outliers, as there always will be. But guys that test really well like that in today's game, and everybody wants to go, you know, Terrell Suggs ran a, a slow 40, dropped to the Ravens. Yes, of course. Today's game's a little different. Guys that would have been playing off-ball linebacker are now edge defenders. Um, speed is key. Explosiveness is king. And those jumps are super, super, super important for finding that threshold. So to me, uh, Aiden Hutchinson supposed to turn in a really great day. Great for him. You know, the Ravens aren't going to touch him. In all likelihood, Kayvon Thibodeau as well. So kind of to help sort out these, these next four, so to speak. And to me, it's David Ajabo, Jermaine Johnson, George Karloftis, and Trayvon Walker as uh, kind of that second run of edge defenders. Trayvon Walker was a really highly rated defensive tackle in high school. Massive, massive, massive man, 6'5", 275. Um, so we'll see exactly where he comes in at. His length is outstanding. So expect him to have super long arms, but is he, you know, a four, seven, five kind of guy, or is he like a four, nine, eight guy? Uh, because I, I just want to see if he's able to be that true edge defender. Is he just going to be more of a tweener more? So, you know, a sub package rusher um, want to see his, his explosiveness. He didn't really show a ton of get off uh, at times, which could have been, you know, Georgia's scheme felt like he was very limited. I want to see the way he works his hands through drills, any hip tightness, foot tightness, ankle tightness, um, you know, it felt like Georgia asked him to be a really, really stout run defender first. And in the pass rush game, someone who was stunting a lot more or uh, just kind of keeping contain a lot of times had a lot more run priority, something Kirby Smart has talked about low gear versus high gear a ton. So to me, you know, a great combine for him could make him a top five, top seven pick, um, depending on what he is. I, I don't think he tested terribly well in high school, but he's uh, been out on the edge a little bit more. And then the other one's George Karloftis. Uh, supposedly he's going to run four seven. Uh, he was on Bruce Feldman's freak list. I think he was like the seventh or eighth guy. He was a, a really, really prestigious track and field athlete, thrower and jumper and things of that nature. So I'm curious to see a lot of people refer to him as a limited athlete. It feels like they're kind of scouting uh, maybe his melanin a little bit more so. And I want to see, you know, what he can do uh, to, to prove if he can hit that kind of threshold. Someone to me who um, shows a full array of, hand counters and intangibles and is he able to kind of uh, be a, a force-based rusher and is able to kind of blow through anchors with power. So that explosion off the line is something I want to see. I want to see those, that 10 yard split, those jump numbers as well, uh, as well as his length. It looks like he doesn't have great length, but we'll see what the measurements come in at uh, and see if that's kind of just more of a, a narrative than it is a truth ultimately. Um, so just seeing his change of direction skills, the way he works through drills as well. And then the other two, I think for me, um, I really like David Ajabo and Jermaine Johnson as potential options for the Ravens at 14. And I think the combine is going to go a long way in separating the two. 
Ajabo, definitely an athlete. Definitely you can feel the rhythm and the, the, the movement skill, the loose, unorthodox movement skill that he has as a pass rusher. Uh, supposed to be around 250. You want to see where he's at? Uh, what is what is that weight? What is that kind of build exactly? He's got a little bit of weight in his trunk. So how explosive, explosive of an athlete is he again? And then, of course, against Jermaine Johnson, who supposedly ran 4'5 and benched 300 pounds when he was 15 years old, um, ended up at Georgia, obviously, go, transfers to Florida State, and finally has you know the season that he was supposed to have. Uh, he was hurt in 2020 at Georgia, but amassed five sacks in seven games in a, in a star studded Georgia lineup, not even really getting, you know, starter reps at all. Um, so someone that has supposedly tested well in the past, someone that shows incredible explosiveness and strength and all kinds of stuff on film. Uh, I think that he's a little bit more of an athlete and as a run defender than George Karloftis is, or uh, really any of these aforementioned guys uh, as an athlete in space, so to speak. So Trayvon Walker can do some interesting things and is a little bigger. So those are the two guys I'm looking to, to kind of, uh, tweak through and work my way through. Uh, the other question to me is, you know, Sauce Gardner uh, competing at the combine at, at you know six three plus, most likely at least a, a tall six two. Feels like he's going to be a six three, somewhere around two hundred pounds. Um, you know, people giving him Richard Sherman comps and Marcus Peters comps and Jimmy Smith comps and a lot of Ravens comps. And uh, it's like that one friend who always you know goes for redheads or something. He's the Ravens type. You know, it feels like it'll be hard for them to pass on him if he makes it to fourteen, but ultimately is he a four, four guy? Is he, if he's like a low four, four guy, I don't think he makes it out of the top, like six or seven picks. He's probably the first corner off the board uh, with how prolific he was in college, how shut down he was, how much offensive coordinators and quarterbacks absolutely avoided him even as like a true sophomore. So uh, it's going to be curious. It, it feels like he might not be as good of a tester as he is a football player, which could help him slide just a little bit, you know, a pick or two. It feels like if he turns in a really great combine, someone's going to fall in love with him really early, even maybe top five. So um, his, his build and his tenacity and what he does in the press jam game and uh, kind of how technical he is with his hands and his hips and his feet at his height for his age are all really impressive. So I think it's going to be easy to, uh, to see him rise up draft boards in a hurry, even more than he has with a good day. And I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think I'm going to bet on him to kind of hit the unders as an athlete a little bit. And uh, maybe fall down the media boards just a bit, and maybe not the NFL boards necessarily, the team boards, so to speak. But in this same cornerback class, I mean, Trent McDuffie's supposed to jump 40 inches and run. Derek Stingley sadly just bowed out, but Kyler Gordon, Andrew Booth, uh, both guys that are supposed to absolutely light the combine on fire. Kyer Elam, a really high level athlete. Marcus Jones is a blazing nickelback and returner. Uh, Roger McCreary is probably going to be a really quick, sudden athlete that can do some fun things. And finally, Tyreek Woolen out of uh, University of Texas, San Antonio. Whew. Man can run, you know, 22 and a half miles per hour in pads on a football field and, and just has speed to boot. I think that he could possibly run the fastest 40 time of any defender, uh, maybe the fastest 40 time of anyone at the combine. Maybe, uh, maybe Calvin Austin might have an edge being a true track athlete. Um, Andrew Booth, I think, is going to surprise people a little bit with what he can do in the jumps and running, but I'm really excited to see what Woolen can do. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, the linebacker position, just a couple guys that I'm, I'm curious about. Devin Lloyd feels like can make or break himself. Uh, you know, a lot of people starting to give him some Micah Parsons kind of comps and some interesting comps of some interesting kind of unique NFL defenders. I don't know that he's going to test like that. I think he might be a little more football player than a, than a track athlete ultimately, but with a, a solid day, you know, I think he's one of the ones that really has a lot riding on this combine. Uh, Leo Chenault, someone who is supposedly about 260 pounds, is kind of the throwback type, might end up playing a little bit more of a hybrid Sam role, uh, blew through Tyler Linderbaum with functional strength. Uh, I think he's a little underrated for what he can do as a linear athlete in terms of running and hunting guys down. I think he has a little bit of movement skill. Supposedly at Wisconsin, he ran like a low sevens three cone. Would like to see him get under you know, a seven um, to show that he's, he's improved there a little bit, work on his flexibility, uh, but has been just a tremendous football intelligence, functional strength, explosive player that I think is, is really going to turn some heads at the combine ultimately. Um, another one that I, I am anticipating to maybe kind of fall by the wayside is another tweener player. Well, I don't know if they're going to have a great combine or not. I, I truly am in the air here is Jalen Petrie out of Baylor, a player that I love, uh, really, really, really do love in terms of his stock and in terms of uh, what he can 
do as a nickel corner, but I'm not sure testing is going to be his forte necessarily. I could see him running a slower 40 and kind of falling by the wayside. And hey, maybe that can help the Ravens. Maybe he can be a, a trade up candidate in the third round or something of the sort. But another couple safeties to look out for Nick Cross out of Maryland. I'm pretty sure ran a low tens hundred in high school. I think he's going to test through the roof, improve his stock a ton. Dax Hill out of Michigan, Justice Hill's brother. I think he's absolutely going to light it up. Could see him being a four threes guy, uh, someone that has range in the middle of the field as well as the man coverage ability to go play in the slot. So someone that I think is absolutely going to be a riser here. But um, then finally across the defensive line, you know, uh, if a guy like Devontae Wyatt runs under a four nine and has a really great ten yard split then it's going to be really hard to keep him out of the first round. I think DeMarvin Leal can really help himself a lot in this group. Uh, Someone that you would like to see play with more strength and explosiveness and kind of uh, looks like a finesse player with a tweener body. What is his frame going to look like? What is his, you know, measurements and testing going to look like? Where can we put him? Is, Is he just going to be that kind of tweener or is he going to be a versatile weapon? I think he has a lot to prove ultimately. Um, Jordan Davis. I don't know. Uh, supposedly runs low fives at 340 you know, plus pounds, six, six. So we'll see uh, another guy to watch out for and could, could really cement himself as a day one guy with a freaky performance and another couple names to watch out for uh, Tito Ogbana out of UCLA is a, a raw kind of guy, six, three, three twenty ish, 35 inch arms, 10 inch hands, uh, really, really, really raw explosive power. I wouldn't be surprised to see him be an elite tester and move up draft boards just a little bit in uh, day three or maybe even into the end of day two, ultimately. So uh, there's some names to watch out for. I guess the final one, Travis Jones, who who feels like he's going to be a better athlete on the football field, a better football player than Tester, but I'm looking for him to to try and prove himself a little bit. Ultimately, uh, you know, just who's going to stand out out of this defensive tackle group as the freak that rises above and gets a, a ton of traction. So there's some names to watch out for. I think those are a lot of the guys that, can really improve their draft stock with a good debt or a good week, so to speak. Right. And there's so much talent in this draft class entirely. And when you look at the defensive side of the ball, I mean, there are those defensive linemen, like 2021, there were not a ton of great defensive linemen who were considered like, Oh, upper echelon top. Like it was Christian Barmore than everybody else, but there were still a bunch of solid contributors who came out of that class. It wasn't just Barmore who came out, but this year you have a ton, the secondary it's corner. You, you have like, the top four in Stingley Booth Jr. You have McDuffie and obviously Sauce Gardner, but then again, it's it's talent throughout all these rounds. And the Ravens, they have nine picks in the top four rounds. They have ten overall, so they have the opportunities. Eric DaCosta loves moving up and down the draft board. They can figure it out. The combine, there are a lot of different ways that players can up or tank their stock. And so over this next week or so here, it'll be really interesting to see who does that. Who does not and who ups their stock and who ends up not doing that but spencer that's all i have for you today thank you so much for joining me here on the show once again what do you have going on this week as the combine week really kicks off yeah i just uh joined bobby trossett alongside my co-host jake luke we gave five prospects to watch i'll be joining cole jackson tomorrow on two guys watching football uh the youtube series you can find to to talk about george karloftis and then after the combine we'll we will be doing the baltimore beatdown big board uh, and I'll be writing some articles for the Purple Prospect Portfolio, the Alliteration Nation. Uh, I know you love it, Kevin. So we'll be getting into draft coverage full swing uh, as the combine goes on this week. And from there, be really starting to break these guys down and, and try and find fits team-wise, Ravens-wise. And if not Ravens, where should they go? Where What system will they fit into? What coaching staff do you think can bring the most out of these prospects? And who, who does it not really matter with? Who's just going to be a football player regardless of where you put them? Uh, feels like there's only a few of those guys every year and we'll try and break it all down. So thank you so much for having me, Kevin. Make sure to go give Kevin five stars and share this podcast with a friend and give some love to the man who gives you the best daily Ravens coverage. Thanks so much. And I'll talk to you guys next week. Awesome. Thanks so much, Spencer. And of course, the link to Spencer's Twitter, the podcast that he hosts, of course, will be down in the description below. But thank you again, Spencer. That's all we have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. When we get back here tomorrow, we'll be answering your mailbag questions. So stay tuned for that. And I will see you tomorrow.